Welcome to the Financial Finesse Podcast, where we'll be discussing tips on how to handle your money and life with skill and style. Your host, Kathy Curtis, CFP, has been helping make finance accessible and intriguing for women for almost 20 years. You'll get savvy, actionable ideas listening to her conversations with some of the coolest and smartest women on the planet. And now, here's your host, Kathy Curtis. I'm Kathy Curtis. Welcome to Financial Finesse. My guest today is Kathy Balasek, an educator, empathy, and grief communication coach, university le- lecturer, speaker, and widow advocate. Kathy teaches financial professionals how to improve their grief literacy communication skills to best serve bereaved clients. She also hosts the One Well Widow podcast, helping widows process their grief and learn from one another. After experiencing the financial uniqueness of widowhood firsthand and learning that 70% of widows leave their financial advisors within the first year, Kathy leveraged her many years of teaching, coaching, and personal experience to create Grief Smart Advisor as a tool to help professionals retain, connect, and support clients experiencing loss, grief, and widowhood. Through her coaching programs, webinars, workshops, and speaking engagements, she trains leaders to build trust and empathy with their clients so they can support them during the toughest moments of their life. Kathy earned a Bachelor of Science degree in education at Montana State University and a Master's of Art degree in education with a concentration in kinesiology. She is currently a lecturer at California State University in Chico in the Department of Communication and Education. In this episode, Kathy shares her own personal story of widowhood and how she came to realize the importance of grief literacy. We also talk about the financial challenges women in particular tend to face when losing a spouse and why with a million women becoming widows each year in the US, it's critical for us to prepare for the unpleasant probability that we'll have to manage our finances on our own one day. Furthermore, Kathy offers alternative phrases to I'm sorry for your loss, that may be more comforting to people who are grieving. She also shares her thoughts on how to respond if you learn about someone's death indirectly, for example, in a Facebook post. And be sure to listen to the end as Kathy explains what she wishes more people understood about grief. Kathy also suggests a variety of resources that can help both widows and advisors to widows. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Hi, Kathy. Welcome to Financial Finesse. I'm really happy you could do this podcast with me. Well, hello, Kathy. It's a privilege to be here. I'm honored that you asked. Great. Um, I thought we'd start by you telling us your story about widowhood, just to get started. Absolutely. So, you know, my, my life, I had it all. Once upon a time, a wonderful husband, beautiful children, a career, and until I didn't. And in my 30s, I became a widow faced with raising five children on my own. My husband died of uh, the long battle of brain cancer. And so I basically went from soccer mom to caregiver to widow and really facing a whole lot of years ahead of me. So Um, let me step back. So you were married very young. I was married um, and three of my children were my stepchildren. Okay. um, From my late husband. And the icing on the cake is that after he died, I was so afraid that I was going to lose those children. And I actually gained those children. So I raised five kids. I'm happy to know that they all graduated from college. I'm an empty nester. So Congratulations. Life, life is good, but it wasn't 
always good. Gosh, first off, so sorry that that happened to you. That sounds absolutely devastating, but obviously you thrived. I did because I did the work. I think anybody listening to your podcast and who's gone through grief, number one, you have to do the work. You have to, to get into group support, grief support, counseling, whatever you can do and whatever you can afford. Because I, that process was one, two or three years, you know. Did you know that you needed that back then? I mean, you were young. So did yeah. you right away join a group? And what was that? No. No, right away, I, you know, I probably spent a year just getting my kids off to school and going back and going to bed yeah. and then setting an alarm to go pick them up. You know, you're just, that first year is just really difficult to even face and the reality and the thing, things still need to get done. Yeah. And so it's exhausting, but there came a point, you know, I had a wonderful support system. I have just the rock star parents that that gave me some tough love. And they said, you know, he's not coming back and you have to show up for these five kids and we will help you, but you gotta get some help. You've gotta get counseling. And it was just, it was what I needed to hear. Mm. Because you, when you're grieving, you're the memories, you kind of wear this little grief cloak around and, and it's comfortable and the memories are comfortable and the pictures are comfortable. And then pretty soon, it's not comfortable, it's debilitating. And so there comes a time where I had to face that, the grief, it was okay to move forward. I wasn't losing the relationship with my husband, that will never end. I just had to t release the pain. Yeah, and I'm sure having those children um, maybe forced you a little bit more to face reality because you can't be grieving, pro no. prolonged grieving around young children either. No, and they're not your grief buddy. They're yeah. dealing with their own grief. And we did a ton of counseling with, with my children because they were all different ages. And I'm telling you, grief psychologists and counselors, especially ones who work with children, they know what they're doing. And the one thing that I always remember from them and I still think about now is, you know, children will only ask what they're ready to hear. Mm. And so, so many adults say, you know, I bet you miss your dad, or I bet you do this. You know, that's not helpful. Yeah. Oh, you know, fucking grief language now, Yes. which is so difficult for people. It's, it's very difficult. Um, because yeah, I, do you miss your dad? Yeah, that that would be a yeah, like no, yeah, no kidding. You're right. You thanks, Einstein, for the question. Yeah. Yes. I so, what would what would be the appropriate question to ask a child in that case? You know, what's really important for people to know in grieving families is to keep keep their dad's name alive. You know, talk about you know, I loved your dad. I remember a story about your dad. I remember when you were born. I re you know. Because it's been 15 years since my husband passed away and my adult children still love to hear people tell them about their father Yeah, and tell a memory. And that never goes away. We learn to walk alongside grief. It never goes away. Yeah. So really what you're saying is don't ask questions. Well, don't ask questions unless you know what to ask. I mean, you're not allowed to ask my child an emotional question about the death of their child, a death of their father. But people don't know that. that so that's mm -hmm. where, okay, so this is where what you do comes in. Yes. You're, you're a grief communication specialist or... Yeah, yeah. What, what other term would you call? You know, you could call it coach, consultant. I work with uh, companies and professionals, specifically in the financial realm, who really help widows. And I help them learn to communicate correctly with grieving people. 
uh, what to say, what not to say, um, how to prepare your practice up front before you know the catastrophe happens. All of those things I work with companies because you know grief literacy is normalizing conversations surrounding grief and loss mm. because we live in this death denying culture where we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. We want to ignore it. We want, you know, it makes people uncomfortable because, you know, we don't want to put ourselves in my shoes because that's somewhere that nobody ever would want to go. Yeah, but so it's we, so much a part of life. It, it's so mm -hmm. strange that our culture has that aversion to facing up to it. It's facing up that it's part of life. Yes, I mean, I don't remember the exact quote, but Margaret Mead said something about when somebody is born, it's like this elation. When they're married, it's jubilation. When they die, we ignore it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's true. Right. You know, it's what happens in when somebody's grieving, it can be very isolating, okay? Because their whole life changed, especially if it's the surviving spouse, mm -hmm. their whole life changed, their income changed, you know, housing decisions, all of those things, social, their routine changes, all of these secondary losses. And what happens is that becomes very isolating. And so when people don't acknowledge someone's pain, grief, or loss, it's even more isolating. Yeah, and that's where the joining the groups, finding yeah. groups that are with of people going through the same thing mm -hmm. is so it's valuable because you, then you won't feel as isolated. Right, and it's being in groups, that's like side-by-side -side understanding, but where grief literacy is the overall population learning where to connect with a griever. Mm -hmm. And that's in the language of knowing what to say, what not. Is grief literacy your term or is that? No, it came from Kenneth Daka, okay. who uh, is a famous researcher writer on grief. So. Um, and what are the, tell us a little bit more about grief literacy. Explain the premise and the, some of the terminology just. Okay, so grief literacy, it's how I help professionals with grief literacy is I kind of give them like a grief 101 course, you know, of when you don't acknowledge people's pain, that's disenfranchised grief. You know, it wasn't acknowledged by you, by your company, you know, um, in our conversations, it was just dismissed. Um, we also talk about anticipatory grief. So many financial advisors that I work with have clients that are experiencing a health diagnosis, putting somebody in long-term care, being the caregiver. Well, even though the death hasn't happened, they're experiencing grief and it's called anticipatory grief. So a lot of things we go over is just learning about what types of grief your clients may be experiencing and what you can do to help them. So valuable. I, you know, I'm, I'm a financial advisor and I work with individuals primarily. And I have many clients that have gone through these various grief stages, either through death or like you said, um, severe illness of a spouse, uh, going into long-term care. And it, it is very hard. It's a very hard time for them. And I think that I'm, I, I'm very empathetic and I have great communication skills and all that, but this is a, this is a specialized area. It really is. So I, I, I welcome that I found you, that you offer um, this kind of training. Well, I, I think it's very specific and I think it's very needed. And, you know, as as career professionals, you know, you've been doing this forever. I've been a teacher and educator forever. We start to see the gaps and we start to see the needs. And, 
you know, when over 70% of widows leave the financial advisor within the first year, and the number one trait that widows want is communication skills, our communication skills. So you start to see, okay, how can we help advisors become grief literate so that they can retain clients, attract new ones, be, build a reputation of that great bedside manner, so to speak, mm -hmm. with people, and really get prepared for what we know is coming. You know, I have to say, I, I've heard that stat many times that 70% of widows leave their advisor. And I have to say, I think it starts way before um, the communication starts way before the death of a spouse where they need to be more inclusive of the spouse in the conversation so that they don't want to leave after the death, right? <laughs> um, Absolutely. And yeah. so many... You know, and I was in that type of, of marriage where I didn't really show up to the meetings with the financial advisor. I, I was in that a traditional sense where I completely trusted my husband to, to do that. It wasn't really what I wanted to do, so I didn't. And then I really, once he died, I felt such guilt that I hadn't taken taken a role. I was ashamed that I didn't understand financial terms, which made it really difficult to show up to my advisor. Mm -hmm. Because this is not an, an untypical situation. No, it's especially in um, the like boomer age women. Yeah. You know, that that had this trad traditional approach. And there's so many things that advisors can do to start having these conversations up front, several ways to invite both parties to the party, basically, <laughs> both parties to the, the meetings, the events, there really should be equal representation. Yeah, and you know, this isn't just for heterosexual couples. Any no. Couple, both parties. Any couple. It is so important that they participate in the finances and know know where the money is. You know, you know, I can see where one person may be stronger financially than the other, maybe takes on a little bit more of a role, but I don't think that's an excuse for the other person to completely ignore everything. And I mean, that's good while you're living, but it, it can be completely devastating if you're not prepared when one person dies. There is no doubt about it. Exactly. And I get a lot of questions from advisors, but you know, like, how do I make that happen? I've invited them to the meeting. Well, you have to continue inviting in a variety of different ways. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's talking to the one client one-on-one -on -one that I really want the other partner here. Maybe it's an email. Maybe it's a women's event. You know, it's not a one and done. Hey, I took the shot. I missed. Didn't happen. Okay. Yeah. We have to really look at how women relate and they're very rapport driven, very conversational, and they're not driven by numbers, goals, data. They're driven by how can my long-term planning affect my life and my experiences and what I want to do with this money. And so it's a different conversation and you have to really develop those conversational topics with women because the reality is, and the statistics say, 80% of men die married. So the longest advisor relationship you're going to have is gonna be with a woman and most likely they'll be a widow. Interesting. So give us the statistics on widowhood right now in America. So over a million widows per year in America. And the average age is 59. That's unbelievable. So you're really looking at a lot of years ahead. So you think if their average is 59, they're probably still working. They probably have children in the home. You know, so we have to modernize the face of widowhood. It's not our grandmother who's 95 knitting in a rocking chair. Right. You know, 
And so the sooner professionals can start really thinking about, this is a way I can help, but this is a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. Huge opportunity because of this huge wealth transfer that's coming. And widows are going to be first in line yeah. for that intergenerational um, wealth transfer. And they're going to be dual inheritors. They inherited from a parent, and then they're also inheriting from a spouse. And people are like, oh, that's kind of like, you know, the, the fox in the hen house. No, it isn't. It's being honest, looking at the numbers, and you're in the best opportunity as an advisor to champion widows. Because no, I, I agree. You can be of huge, huge help to a woman that is knows that they need help and does have a financial advisor. You know, not mm -hmm. all people have financial advisors. Not all widows do. Right. Um, and so, I mean, what would you, how do you advise, do you ever counsel women individually or, or do you do more of the professional training? I, I do two things. I work with financial or insurance, professional, somewhere in that realm. And I do group trainings of both men and women. Like these are the financial advisors. I'm going to teach you how to be grief literate. And I also train with webinars and companies where we train your team. Okay. Okay. So I, I love, I love opportunities where I can work one-on-one. -on -one. I currently have a group course going with eight students because I, I like the small group. Yeah. And they're just, they're independent financial advisors and they're just killing it. They're getting, you know, they're getting more clients. They're becoming known for working with bereaved clients and they're just building a confidence and competence of knowing what to say. So give me, um, let us know about one of your lessons. So okay. you're, you're, um, training an advisor to become more grief literate or or maybe to prepare their women clients for the possibility that could happen, right? Do right. You, you do yes. that? Okay. Yes. So give us an example of what you would tell a financial advisor to do to prepare their women clients. Okay, excellent. So I think I believe in preparation <laughs> in everything. Okay, that's the controllable piece, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> one thing I work with a lot with advisors of really getting a system and organizational process for all of the tasks and paperwork that you know your client is going to need to do that first year. Okay, that, that can be set up. What, what's in the first column, what's in the later, what's in the middle, you know, and having those processes all set up. What, what does the surviving spouse do and their family, which tasks do they do, which ones need a professional help, you know, and so it's a checks and balance. So we have that set up. I have them set up protocols for exactly what you would say on the phone, because you're gonna be the one of the first calls, right? Yeah. So what do you say? If they don't answer the phone, what do you leave on the message? You know, do you go to the service? Do you not go? You know? Interesting. All of those what, things. What do you say to that? What What is your advice? Go. go, okay. Go, if they were your client, you go. and. You can find out through either an obituary or a funeral or service home if it's a certain specific religion or if it's a, if they're only taking friends and family. You can do some homework to figure out if they won't, don't want you there. But mm -hmm. pretty much if they were your client, you've reached out to them, they've reached out to you, go. Mm -hmm. And know exactly what to say. You know, you say three things. You mention the person's name. You know, I'm so sorry for your loss. I loved and appreciated your husband, James. He was such a light when we would come to our meetings. And I remember a story of, and then you're just going on. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with finances. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but you, you're preparing that because this is very awkward. It's like Bambi standing up for the first time, a baby deer. It's awkward. So we have to practice and script it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work is practicing scripting what you would say so it sounds authentic. And you know, there's nothing wrong with scripting. No. It, I it, mean, if it's helpful to the client and the person, I believe in that too. I really do. You know, it's fundamental to communication, like any fundamental. I mean, Steph Curry, who's one of the best basketball players, as you know, because we're in the Bay Area. <laughs> yeah. He still works on fundamentals. He oh, still yeah. really How many free throws does he do a day? Exactly. So <laughs> if you want to sound authentic, you have to write it in words that you would say. You have to practice it in the mirror or try it with a family member. And really watch about your eye contact, your body language. Yeah. Because when you meet with a bereaved client, they're going to remember 10% of what you say, 90% of how you made them feel. Yeah. And when you can show up authentically and you're saying the right things and you're, you're listening to learn, not listening to solve you're going to get that safe space created initially with your client. And that's really what you want. That's a beautiful thing. So well said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, trying to think of other things. Oh, we set up some protocols for the first office visit. That's another thing you can prepare up front okay. is not, not all people want to come to your office. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, give them some choices. You know, we could meet at your home. We could meet at a neutral space. Zoom. You know, all of those things. Give them, set up a protocol of this is what you could expect. Send them out an email of really how that first meeting will look. You know, you right. follow it up with an email of the next steps. And so that they're not blind. The first by meeting it. you have alone, right? Yes. With this person. Yes. Who may or may not know the details of the family finances. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's important to build trust, to build a safe space. You know, simple things that we don't think about when I'm meeting somebody for the first time, just eye contact and me writing notes builds trust. Mm -hmm. It's the little things that ounce by ounce by ounce, pretty soon you have a client that trusts you. What do you think the um, advent of Zoom meetings has done, is doing to this process? Do you still think you can convey your feelings and thoughts and emotions across the screen to a grieving person? I think number one, if, if it's the mode of communication that your client desires, then that's where you start. And ideally, I mean, I'm, I don't love Zoom, you know, I've, I'm a college professor, I like to be with students out and, and I'm animated. However, I have to go where my clients need me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that message needs to be first, the mode of communication is based on what your client needs. Right? Well, and also a lot of advisors now have clients all over the place mm -hmm. because of the pandemic and people seem um, it's easier for clients to hire advisors anywhere. Mm -hmm. So they find an advi advisor that specializes in what they want. They hire them. It could be across the country. So you'll have to communicate in that way. So I guess it's, it's, it's learning the skills to work with the, bereaving person over, over an electronic meeting. Well, and to be, to be real, Kathy is like you and I just met. Yeah. And yet we spent four or five minutes getting to know one another. We already found connections, similarities, shared purposes. We care about what each other are doing. Right. <laughs> and that was done on zoom. Yeah. Women are really good at this. What you just described though. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> men 
men communicate differently. There are different communication styles. One is not better or the other. I mean, I think it as the yin and the yang, we need both, okay? Yeah. And communication styles, women are more conversational. They add more personal information. They're very rapport, relationship driven, where men are very report driven. Fa da data, facts, processes, goals, you know, very in order. And this is not all men or women, but this yeah. is general communication style. So it's really recognizing in an advisor scenario where your client resonates right. and, and really talking to them in their language. Because, you know, I think back of your question about grief literacy and, you know, grief is like a universal experience but it's not a universal language. It's a foreign language to many of us. Mm -hmm. And so when we say things that divide, like we try to justify somebody's death or, we're, or we say, oh, you know, at least they lived a long life or it's, it was God's plan or yeah. all of these things that what just- about, What about the, I'm so sorry for your loss. Okay, that's been done, <laughs> that, right? I mean, if you are going to be, I'm just going to put it in terms that make sense to me. It's, I don't take offense to what people say. People don't know any better yet because they haven't met me yet. <laughs> My charge is I'm going to make everybody grief literate. However, when they say, I'm sorry for your loss, That is not going to encourage a conversation. And what we want is we want to say things that build connection and further the conversation. Okay. And so saying, I'm sorry, that's a sentence starter. Okay. It's not an ending. I'm sorry for your loss. It's been said. And if you want to stand out from the crowd in, in your life and in your industry, you got to do more. Tell us an alternative phrase or phrases. Okay. Uh, saying things like, I was sorry to hear about your mother's death. Mm. I didn't know her well, but I can imagine knowing you that you had a lot of qualities that she possessed. What's one thing that you really loved about your mother? Do you see where I'm, yeah. I'm pulling you in? I'm showing that I care. I'm, I'm acknowledging that I didn't know your mother. Or you say something like, if you want to start, I'm sorry for your loss. Because that's a sentence starter. I'm so sorry for your loss. I read about your husband's passing and... I knew him on a couple occasions. And what I really appreciated about John was that he always put what I wanted to say first. He always made the conversation about me, even though I was there for him. And that selflessness, I will never forget. Mm -hmm. You see how I am actually saying their name. I'm acknowledging the person's loss and I'm telling a memory yeah. of what, what will be be remembered. That's, that is what is supportive and it's soothing. Yeah. Um, just taking it out of the realm of the client advisor thing for a minute, even um, people use social media now to announce the death of somebody, uh, Facebook, for example, and you'll see all the responses. And a lot of them are, I'm so sorry for your loss. What would be a better way to respond when somebody, because obviously they're posting it on social, social media, so they want people to know, and they know people are going to respond in some way, right? Mm -hmm. what, what would be a better way to respond in that instance? So when somebody dies, not everybody knows. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, if you didn't read it in the obituary, you didn't know. Right. But now somebody dies and that evening it's on Facebook. 
So when you see something on social media, you have some options. The best option is, is if you knew that person, write them a card, mm. call them, private message them. Okay. Grief and sending these condolence messages out in the world. It's not a true representation of truly how you feel. So why don't you take that opportunity of, I just read that information. I have this news. How about I make a phone call? How about I write a letter? You know, how about I drop something off? How about I send something? You know, it comes back to, we have the information. The receiver wants to know that you actually spent some time really thinking about their loss and really doing something that was meaningful. You know, we... We think we can just go to the, you know, sympathy card aisle, grab a card, sign our name. Well, it's so much richer if you write from a blank note card and you write three heartfelt sentences. Right. Sign your name. I have a whole box of my cards that I got. The ones I reread were the personal messages. I... <laughs> I so agree with you. I've had death in my family and I saved the cards that someone wrote something that really touched me. Yes. And it, they really do help. They help. And I mean, as fundamental as that sounds, that's something I teach my students in my class. No, I, uh, you know, my advisors, they don't know what to write or yeah. if a client lost a child or if a client got a cancer diagnosis, they don't know what to write. No, That's it's the piece of my curriculum. Yeah. It's the simple, fundamental human processes that are missing that is leaving this gap in between a griever and somebody who truly wants to help them but doesn't know how. Right. And it's not, I mean, it's not to say sending a card that already has a grief message in it and sign it is okay, but you're losing such an opportunity to make somebody feel better and really let them know that you care. Yes. Right. Yes. So and the time to do that in a, in a deeper way than, and I, I'm get your message is loud and clear. And I, I so agree with you. Well, when you think about it, when, when, when advisors are working with really this, this family's whole life savings, can't you spend about 15 minutes to write a heartfelt card? Because a sympathy card, nothing really nails it, okay? Yeah. Nothing really does. And so it's, it's just- But it's because resonates. we don't know what to say. Yes. Right, we don't know what to say. So the sympathy card makes it easy- Right. To check that box off. Right, but because what it's it, uncomfortable because we're uncomfortable with death. It's it's so and, true and completely normal, right? Yeah. That is completely normal to feel awkward, uncomfortable, don't know what to say, to pro you know, even procrastinate on sending something. Yes, beyond the point that you're embarrassed to even send it. Yes, and so. <laughs> Our hearts are wired for compassion, but our head gets in the way and we're like, oh, I, I shouldn't say this or I shouldn't do that or that might be helpful. And then pretty soon we've talked ourselves out of it. Exactly. You know, if you think they need something, you know, like I bet they would love a case of beer. I love, I bet they would love some juice boxes because they have kids. Just go buy it and drop it off at their house. Right, right. You know? I, 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 you know, uh, I just had a, a client who lost his wife and um, I know the casserole thing it's, it, but people need food. Out. They don't want to cook for themselves after somebody dies. No, right? we, it is kind of a running joke in our household, but it's so helpful and practical. And, you know, I can remember one of my teenagers after, this was way after John died. 
and somebody else had had a, a death in the neighborhood and my teenager said, yeah, wait till the casseroles start showing up. <laughs> I mean, do people still do that? Is that, yes. that and there's, okay. there's a ton of like apps and websites where you can do meal train and you can plan on who's giving what and all of that. Okay. Food is very helpful. It's comforting. Um, it's, you know, a gift card to order out. Yeah. You know, stamps, you, th you know, stamps and blank note cards, just practical things that people don't think of about. I recently pulled a group of widows and I'm in several widows group, but I'm also um, on the advisory board for Modern Widows Club. And the number one thing that widows did not want were flowers. Oh. What, what do we all send them? flowers you know not only did i just see my husband died but now you said flowers. flowers they're gonna die now i gotta throw them away <laughs> oh yes <laughs> so so much and you have to take care of flowers exactly Even at a time when you probably don't want to take care of anything else but yourself you exactly. have to change the water and and make sure it's not stinky and you know all that stuff you have to do with flowers yeah. I think people, um, they genuinely mean well. There yeah. are so many caring individuals. There are so many people that do things in the in the death and grief area that they know what they're talking about. And I've learned so much from people I've met, research I've done that will, that's truly supportive to a family. Yeah. And it's basic things that you don't really think about. You know, as an advisor, you know, you should be the best resource on the planet for your bereaved client. Yes. You know, who am I going to call if I have a broken pipe, mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of the night when you are solo suddenly yeah. alone, female, you don't want a stranger coming to your house. Yeah. You your know, garage door all of a sudden won't open, which just happened to me this morning. My yeah. husband's away exactly i don't know how i didn't know how to buy a car okay you know and it, i want to come to my advisor and say who could who could you send me to you know who could i give your name to that would not <laughs> take me <laughs> at the at the car place yeah. no so, I, I i know with my own experience that being a resource having um vetted resources yes. for your client as vetted as you can Yes. You know, is so important to clients in so many areas of their life and not just financial. It is. Yeah, it is. So that's, that's a piece of my program that we really work on is that curated list of okay. vetted professionals that you could recommend to, to your bereaved clients, because it's, it's an overlooked thing, but it's something you could do right now in the preparation yeah. stage. Yes. And, and carry that through to all other aspects of your financial plan mm -hmm. just too. Um, vetting professionals for your clients, but particularly in this area, it would be so welcome and needed. Well, and think of caregiving. Okay. So how many people come to you and they need caregivers or they need advice or a professional? This is an opportunity for you to find the best caregiving professionals in your community. Right. Um, pretty soon you offer, become um, best practices in vetting professionals. For me, I don't have that a piece of my program, but my recommendation is whoever you recommend, you should have called or known first. Yeah. And so that when you say to your client, you know, I would like you to use my name when you call, because I know this person and I'm referring you to this person that I trust. That's the biggest recommendation. I mean, I have, you know, I have people I know, but I have people I wouldn't recommend. And I have, we know people in our community and we know who would be a better fit for somebody else. Right, right. What I do typically is if I don't know the professional personally or they haven't worked with the client, I will, I will, 
refer them because they they usually they're referred to me by somebody I trust and I'll make sure my client knows that I have not worked with this person before but it they were referred to me by somebody I really trust and you know let them know so mm -hmm. they're aware that I'm not I don't specifically know their work right yeah right I just think honesty and you know I think women are very much a word of mouth type of community. You know, I'm reminded when my when my kids were young, I didn't have to go see which teachers I wanted for my children or which hairdresser to go to. I just asked around. Yeah. And and it gets around. Okay, if you want to go to this restaurant, this is what they're known for. This teacher is what they're known for. And it gets around. I didn't have to go Google it or research it. Right. We talk. Yeah. Yeah. And and when you are an advisor, if you can get dialed in to your community of who's the best, I mean, why wouldn't you recommend that? Yeah, exactly. So um, so you, it sounds like you've worked with quite a few financial professionals. What would you say is the biggest mistake that they make with a grieving client? I think the biggest mistake they make is um, they don't invest the personal side up front. You know, they they think about all the things that have to be done and the financial things that have to be done. And those first couple meetings really need to be just about building a self a safe space, listening to your client you know, learning about your client, helping them get organized. And I think they rush in with too many, like, we've got to get this done. We've got to get that done. You know, what do you think about? What will you do next year? What, you know, yeah. it's like widowhood is like a thousand piece puzzle, putting back the pieces where you don't even know the picture on the box. Yeah. Okay. You can't even picture. Okay. That. And Going in with too much information, financial information up front, because, you know, grief fog is that cognitive impairment that that grievers, you know, feel. And it's it can show up in forgetfulness, confusion, overwhelm. So they're not going to remember it anyway. Yeah. And so really invest in the trust, the communication, knowing the players. Who, who's at home taking care of all of these things? Who in the family is communicating with what? And really helping them so that nothing falls through the cracks. Kathy, what would you say is the one thing that you wish more financial professionals or even people in general understood about grief? That's a, that's a tough question, but I love that you asked it. Um, I think the number one thing that every human needs to understand is that grief has no timeline. It's not linear and in all these stages. It, it is all over. And one person's grief, you know, some of the signs and symptoms might be several years. Mm. Some might be shorter. And I think as, as people, we tend to go into a little bit of, of disillusioned expectation. Like, hey, it's been three years. Aren't you over it yet? And it really tends to um, disenfranchise some of these grief and work. Right. And, and grief never leaves us. It's not a hurdle we get over. It was the end of a, a life, not an end of a relationship. And grievers learn to walk alongside. Yeah, so. Perspective. Thank you for that. So I'm sure listeners would, I mean, you have so much knowledge in this area. It's obvious. And you've done a lot of research. And I'm sure you've got some resources that um, widows or advisors of widows could use. Do you mind sharing a few? I would love to. So... Again, there's just so many people doing great things out there. It's unbelievable. I just, am, I'm, I feel privileged to be a part of the puzzle. And so number one, if you have widow clients, the best 
resource you can give them is send them to Modern Widows Club. Oh, okay. It is an international nonprofit. I'm actually on the advisory board, which that was a whole honor. And it's the only widow group that is actually doing research on this demographic. And so they have research supported evidence of what helps widows move forward, helps them thrive. And they have, you know, community outreach groups all across the world. And so that you can get connected with other widows. So, and you can, you get all different types for financial, emotional, you know, social, all these things that will help you move forward as a widow. So it's awesome. Um, I highly recommend that. And the person who created it, Carolyn Moore, is a widow herself. And she and I actually shared a stage um, speaking at a financial advisory convention. And she's just remarkable what she's done. And thank you for that. This perfect. So that is. And you yourself have a, a resource, I believe. Yes. You know, I have a couple, like if your financial advisor too is anything by Kathy Sikorsky on caregiving, and she talks a lot about how to talk about these difficult conversations. She's great. Um, Grief literacy, Megan Devine. It's okay that you're not okay. These are excellent books. And, you know, I believe that if, if you get to know me and work with me I'm going to help you grow your business. I have programs. I have coaching programs. I have an online course. I can do a webinar for your team and we can train your team of really getting grief literate so that you can connect and engage with bereaved clients. I really enjoy seeing the advisors and the companies that I've worked with because they're seeing success. They're truly knowing how to show up with their bereaved clients because it's happening all around us. This is what we will never avoid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to not practice it during the fire drill. (laughs) You know, we have, have to do it up front. And it's just been a ton of fun getting great resources out to my clients that can truly support them in becoming the best advisor they can for their clients. So I'm going to add this to my show notes, but in case people don't read the show notes, how do they reach you? So my website is kathyvelasic.com. And if you just want to email me, it's kathy at kathyvelasic.com. And that's K-A-T-H-I. Yes. Right? Okay. And if they have widow clients, I also run a podcast called One Well Widow, where I help widows moving forward. I've listened to it. Some of the stories are so sad, but really, really great podcast. Thank you. So that's my kind of advocacy of helping widows. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I've really enjoyed talking with you, Kathy. And um, I look forward to re-listening to this podcast myself because I learned many things. So thank you for your time. Well, you're welcome. You do. It's a privilege. I, I'm just so excited to meet women like you who are forging ahead and leading us all. So thank you. Okay, Kathy. Take care. You too. Cheers. Hey, cheers.